This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. For the crew of this yacht, ending up in a life or death situation was the furthest thing from their minds. But when an unexpected storm blows in, Mayday! Mayday! these sailors barely know what hits them. Adrift in shark-infested waters, their bodies rapidly begin to shut down from dehydration and infection. Death is a relief for some. Staying alive, a nightmare for the others. Who survives on I Shouldn't Be Alive? On a near-perfect Indian summer day in October, the 58-foot luxury yacht Trashman set sail for Fort Lauderdale, Florida from Bar Harbor, Maine. The boat's name isn't lost on those who know of her owner. He's made his money, and lots of it, in the garbage business. It's a delivery run for the yacht. She's carrying a pickup crew of five that just hired on for this sail. 1,300 miles down the eastern seaboard on a course sometimes referred to as Hurricane Alley. Weather permitting, it's a six-day trip. Weather permitting. The crew's an odd mix. Deborah Scaling Kylie is the most experienced member, with boasting rights of being the first American woman to have completed the grueling Whitbread Around the World yacht race. I love to sail because you're working with nature. There's another force, and, and you become one with that force. And, and I'm a, a junkie for it. I'm an adrenaline junkie. The skipper is John Lippeth. He's an affable sort of guy with some solid sailing experience. He showed me his resume, and it was quite impressive. He had actually been on a boat called Black Knight, which was the committee boat for the America's Cup. And, and you know, to be the skipper of that boat, you can't be all bad. You've got to be a pretty good, pretty good boatman. Is everything all right? Meg Mooney is along for the ride. She doesn't have any real sailing experience, except for being the skipper's girlfriend. Meg was fun. She lightened things up. She was kind of a girly girl. It was kind of fun to, to, to hang out with her for a while. I hadn't done that in a long time. Brad Cavanaugh joins the crew when he hears his friend Debbie is on board. He's a capable sailor, but knows there's more to learn. I'll take the next watch with John. Ask him to come up. I was in heaven. I was on... The big version of my parents' boat with these nice new people heading to Fort Lauderdale, and I couldn't have been happier. It was so different from what I'd been accustomed to. It's like I could relax for a change and enjoy the ocean. The winds are ideal. By nightfall, the coast is a distant eight hours away. The weather was beautiful. The boat was fun to steer. Um, it really just didn't get much better than it was right then. Someone is always on watch, but little does the crew know as they hunker down for the night. Just 300 miles southeast, a massive tropical storm is building. Its edges are heading straight towards a powerful high pressure system in the northwest. As these two forces collide, the winds squeezed between them accelerate to 70 miles per hour, pushing up waves more than 30 feet high. Trashman is sailing in the middle of this collision course. Meg, a bit uneasy, goes up on deck. Bad move. Meg had gone up on deck, and when the boat fell, her tether didn't keep her from falling. Debbie! Wake up! Debbie! Blowing a gale out there. Meg's falling. She's hurt, and we're taking on water. John! She's hurt real bad. Can you come take a look at her? Ah! How did the storm come in? This was something that was building momentum. Meg, what the hell were you doing up on deck in this weather anyway? 
Debbie, leave it. Just help her, okay? But don't Debbie, for once, would you just do what I say? She rolled over slightly, and you could see the bruising begin, and it was all through the kidney area. I could just tell she was in so much pain. I want to go home, John. Take me home. Yeah. There's no. Brad and I went up on deck to take our next watch, and it was wildly out of control. At the helm is the fifth member of the crew, Mark Adams. He's a friend of Brad's, and to the others, a bit of a wild card. Oh, Brad! He doesn't seem at all concerned about the bad weather, and he's doing his own thing without a care in the world. Mark's up on deck, just woo, howling at the wind, and I could see why. The wind was like 40 miles per hour, and I started to get a little worried, just a little bit concerned. John is anxious to get help for Meg, so he radios the Coast Guard. They advise him to head inshore to Wilmington, North Carolina. Easier said than done. John discovered that he didn't have any charts to take him into this part of the coast. It was just one more little omen that things weren't great. It was that he wasn't prepared. This is a sailing vessel trash man calling Coast Guard. We urgently need a compass heading so we can head in shore. We have no chart. Over. The Coast Guard advised us that we should go to Wilmington, North Carolina. But when we altered course and headed into the coast, those waves just started smashing into the boat and impacting us. By heading west towards the coast, Trashman's crew turns her side on to what locals call the North Wall. It's claimed bigger ships than Trashman. In these freak conditions, as the storm waves race forward, the Gulf Stream pushes at the bottom of every wave, so they become steeper, with peaks that break like crashing surf. By following the Coast Guard's instructions, Trashman is hit repeatedly broadside by the advancing walls of water. Surfing down those waves, it was like a roller coaster. And it's like an elevator when it drops. The yacht's sails have been trashed by the storm. John's nursing the overworked engine, the only way to power through the waves. The alarms all went off and the engine overheated. The engine was gone and that was the end of our ability to charge the batteries. We were quickly going to be running out of power to speak to anybody from off the vessel. Now we had no engine, no sail, and we were just floating out there in the ocean. Running on emergency power. We need assistance immediately. We're in trouble, our engine is down, our sails are damaged. We need immediate rescue, over. Two merchant ships are relatively close by, and the Coast Guard asks them to head towards the trash man. It gave us this false sense of security, and I think that's probably the kiss of death. Roger that, over. The auxiliary power finally dies. Come in, please, Coast Guard. This is Trashman. Are you still there? Over. All means of communication me, are Trashman gone. Calling Coast Guard. Over. There is no way to steer or power the Trashman. There's nothing this crew can do but hope to ride out the storm in one piece. When it gets dark and you're in a storm that you really don't know the magnitude of, it's frightening. There's no sailor in the world that can tell you it's not. It's the monster in the dark. And you don't know if it's under your bed and you don't know when it's coming out. But you know it's coming out. One of these times we got to the top of, of one of these waves and it crested and broke like at the beach like Hawaii 5 -0. and the boat fell off the top, you know, we were in free fall. And then we impacted against the window, and the water just poured in. Debbie! Debbie! We gotta get out of here! Oh, go! Oh, go! Let's get out of here! Go! 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 Here's the boat sinking, and we're scrambling to get to the deck, and I hear John over here going, Mayday! Mayday! We're sinking! We're sunk! Anybody! And I get up on that deck, 
And it was just like a slow motion dream. We're going down, and we're going down fast. As the waves continue to batter the trash man, her crew scramble for their lives. You don't think about dying. You don't think about drowning. You don't think about anything. You think about getting away from this boat that is going under, and it's sinking in less than two minutes. It's just going down like a big rock. Mark frantically struggles to free the fiberglass canister that contains an inflatable life raft and survival equipment, while Brad tries to salvage the small rubber dinghy. I swam after the dinghy, kicking off my sea boots and my foul weather bottoms, thinking, my dad's going to kill me. I've just let his boots sink. And then thoughts of my mother and how s horrified she was going to be and how sad that she, when she learned that I had died there in the ocean. Mark heaves the canister off the boat and follows it into the ocean. The life raft inflates. And Mark is still holding on, and eventually he just lets go. The life raft is blown away, and we weren't going to find it in the middle of the night. Nothing! You managed to get anything from the yacht! Nothing! We're dead! Inside that life raft was everything that we needed to live, to survive what we were going through. It had an emergency beaconing device, which a plane could have picked up on, had water makers to make fresh water from salt water. Food, fish hooks, maras, signaling devices. And in that rubber zodiac dinghy, we had absolutely nothing. I'm so sorry I lost the life raft. Our chances for survival were zero. We're all gathered around the rubber zodiac dinghy, and I remember watching Trash Man as the last little foot of her mast slipped under the water. And it was the most devastatingly lonely feeling that I've ever felt in my life. By contacting the Coast Guard, they should have been on the way. Cavalry rushing in. All we needed to do was stay afloat and they'd find us. The next day, when the sun finally came up, the sky was overcast and gray. The air temperature being 40, we would definitely succumb to hypothermia. Let's get under the dinghy! There's a shelter! Oh, I can't! No. I can't! We'll be out of the wind! Instead of getting into the dinghy, Debbie suggests the crew get underneath it, using it to shield them from the cold winds. She knows that if their body temperatures drop too low, they're all in big trouble. Oh, come on! Check on you! The sad thing was is that Meg just couldn't participate. I think it was too painful for her. But more than anything, Meg was very claustrophobic. They're in the water for six hours before Debbie decides their plan isn't working. Okay, we gotta get out of the water. It's cooling us down. Get over We devised a system where we positioned our bodies suspended by a line that we'd rigged. Lie right down next to me. By stacking ourselves like a bunch of fuel rods in a nuclear power plant, we were able to share our body heat and to keep ourselves warm. That's fine for the crew sandwiched up under the dinghy, but Meg's still in the water, and it's sucking the warmth out of her body faster than she can make it up. The blood supply to her arms and legs is shutting down. 
Her breathing quickens as her heart races to support the shivering that's trying to warm her up. If her body temperature continues to drop, Meg's heart will stop beating. Whatever the risk, Debbie just knows that they have to get her out of the water. We decided we would flip the Zodiac dinghy over and we lift Meg in. I was horrified at her wounds. The wire in the rigging had cut almost all the way to the bone and she had huge gaping wounds on her leg. It was heartbreaking. Just those wounds alone were a death sentence. <laughs> Too bloody cold, aren't you? Let's turn it back over. We're gonna freeze to death. Look, man, you wanna go back in the water and help yourself? It's a whole ocean out there. We hung there for a minute, and pretty soon he goes, quit kicking me. I'm not touching you. See it again. Cut it out. What are you talking about? I am not kicking you. you stop now. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to look in the water, and I'm going to see where his legs are, and I'm going to stay as far away from him as I can. And it was the most eerie sensation. And I noticed these, like, torpedo-shaped bodies. I thought, fish. And then... All of a sudden, one came really close, and I realized it was like hundreds of sharks. They were everywhere. Sharks! Sharks! And just the minute we got in fins, just everywhere in the water, and I don't mean like two or three, I mean 10, 20, they were everywhere. Meg's open wound is leaving a trail of blood and pus. Even though it's quickly diluted in the ocean, infinitely small traces remain that sharks can detect. The tiny folded tissues in their nose are lined with millions of chemical sensors that give it an extraordinary sense of smell, 10,000 times more powerful than a human's. Sharks literally can detect a drop in the ocean. I've never seen so many sharks in my life, not in my entire trip around the world. It was the most frightening feeling I've ever felt. Sharks, I'm warning you, do not hit! A single shark with that! Are you out of your mind? What do you think you want? You're gonna calm him down? Give me that! Our biggest threat was not just the coal, but a wave breaking underneath us and flipping the zodiac over and dumping us back into the shark infested water. So, what we had to do is devise a system to try to slow the little rubber zodiac down. Hey, Debbie! Do you think maybe we can make a sea anchor out of this thing? Stabilize this tub? But as soon as we threw the piece of plywood over the front of the boat, the shark swam up and grabbed it in its mouth. These were not little sharks. And this one was big enough to pull a 13-foot rubber zodiac dinghy with five people in it wildly through the water. By nightfall, the storm dies down and the strong winds move out. This band of five is grateful to have survived a shark attack, but they remain wet and cold, and now hungry and unbearably thirsty. It's night two, and with night comes just that threat of not being able to make it through the night again. A light! A light! Oh God, it's close! Paddle! At first, when you see the light, you just are so excited you can't stand yourself. They're coming to rescue you. And then you realize the reality of the situation is it's pitch black. You're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and nobody can see anything. For the moment, they're hopeful. 
Then the reality of how they're feeling reminds them of their predicament. The craving for water is like nothing I've ever felt. It's as if every cell in your body needs it and it's crying out for it. You haven't had water in 24 hours, you know, almost 48 hours. But then the crew seems to get their first break. I can remember lying there and opening my mouth, but all I got was the wind blowing through my mouth and actually drying my mouth and my tongue more than the moisture coming in from the rain. Brad, like the others, is massively dehydrated. The flesh in his body is actually drying out. Without enough water, his blood pressure is dropping. His heart is pumping harder. Without enough water to make urine, toxins are building up in his bloodstream. If he doesn't get fresh water, he'll be unconscious in four days, dead in seven. All of a sudden, we remembered about the ship, and we looked out, and the ship was gone. Maybe that was a chance for survival. It, it's just its the ultimate despair. And at that point, I just couldn't take it. I was... I felt that I was being teased by the environment and by the powers that be. Oh, I stood up and I gave God the finger, started, you know, saying, what are you doing to us? If you're going to make it rain, let it rain so we can get some water. And the last thing you wanted to do is curse God because that was about the only chance we had for survival. And what would kill them first? Dehydration? Hypothermia? The sharks? There was always a fin somewhere. They were always bumping into the raft and pushing us around. Then they'd go away for a while, and just about the time you think that they'd gone away, they came back again. One question runs like a loop through all their minds. Where's the Coast Guard? For that matter, where are the merchant ships the Coast Guard said they would send Trashman's way? Well, we were starting to get very frustrated with the Coast Guard because without food and water we were really starting to suffer. Hey, do you think a ship will rescue us before the Coast Guard finds us? Coast Guard's on its way. Yeah, sure, of course. Coast Guard's on its way. Hey, guys, I got news for you. The Coast Guard ain't coming. <laughs> they never were. They forgot about us. We're on our own. Thanks a lot, Debbie. <laughs> it was as if I had dropped the final curtain on the show. They just all kind of sat back and looked at me like I'd lost my mind. Hey, Brad, where do you think we are? Uh, well, from roughly where we went down, we're anywhere between 35 and 135 miles off the coast. What? Is that far? We could still be blown to shore, right? Guys. <laughs> In fact, the dinghy is drifting towards the middle of the Atlantic. The bottom of the boat was fetid. It had a mixture of urine and blood and pus. We were in absolute agony because we were starting to get massive staph infections all over our bodies. When I looked at Meg's leg, I, I was mortified. Her wounds were open and already beginning to fester. By now, the bacteria are multiplying out of control, and Meg's body is just too weak to fight them off. Her blood vessels are being squeezed, and there is no longer enough blood reaching Meg's leg. It's dying, and the poisons from the infection are spreading through her body. She's dying of blood poisoning, and we were sitting there watching Meg die. It was just tragic. The five survivors of the trash man are barely holding on to life after three days at sea. Night three, with all the infection coming on and the starvation setting in, we all were getting very delirious.
What are you doing? That stuff will kill you! Well, everyone knows that you're not supposed to drink seawater. They tell us that from the time we're little kids, and that's one of the things you just don't do. Drinking salt water dehydrates your body even more, and it causes kidneys to shut down, and you begin to have delusions. And, and ultimately, if you drink salt water, it will kill you. I didn't really know how long it would be before we saw the effects of the salt water, but it stood to reason to me that it would be probably seven hours or so. And I was right. It didn't take all that long. <laughs> It's too hot. Where's <laughs> uh, oh. everybody? It was just like I was watching some crazy play. I love my bloody fights! Wait. I see land. I see land! I see land! It's right there, man. You see it? It's right there in front of us. We just now found this, Meg. We go to the hospital where my mom works. She'll take care of us. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We're nowhere near Falm. That's total crap, man! It's over there. This went on all day long. The monotony of it was starting to drive me crazy. I'm just gonna get my car. We're in the middle of nowhere. You guys bring the boat in, and I'll go get the car. There is no car, John. <laughs> There it is. I see it. I'm just gonna get the car. And then all of a sudden, he jumps off the side of the boat. John. And we're like, where are you going? There is no land, there is no Falmouth, and there are a lot of sharks out there. You need to come back. John. Get back in the boat, John. John, go back in the boat. Go back in the boat. John, he's going to Brad, do something. I can't. I just... I of the energy, Debbie. Look how far away he is. There's just physically not enough strength in me to force him not to go. I can't see him. All of a sudden, we just hear this shrill scream. I mean, blood curdling. And it was over. And then silence. And it was like there was no crying. There was no nothing. He's gone. There wasn't any doubt what had happened to him. The sharks got him. The sharks never left. I was angry with him because I really felt that I would get a lot of credit for surviving and having everyone survive. I, I looked forward and relished the thought of being heroic. And uh, there's nothing heroic in what I had done in this instance, which was stand by while John swam off to meet the shark. Of the four remaining survivors from the shipwreck trash man, only Brad and Debbie still have their wits about them after four days at sea. Meg's barely alive and Mark is delusional. I'm just going back to the 7-Eleven to get some more beer and cigarettes. Mark, you're not going to the 7-Eleven for anything. You, 
You know we're in this dinghy, don't you? I'm just going over for a minute. Wants to stretch my legs. And get rid of the cramps. Just for a moment. Brad and I get up and go, man, the sharks just ate John. No, 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 no. I'm just stretching my legs. Getting right back in. We feel this. Bam! Then we feel a bam again. And there's like this frenzied attack. And the sharks are eating Mark underneath the Zodiac. It was, without a doubt, the most horrifying moment of my entire life. The sharks now had a taste of what they'd been following for days, and they wanted, they wanted more. So they tried to tip the boat over with Meg, Debbie, and I in the raft. And it lasted for what seemed like an eternity, like hours. That night, I remember waking up and looking up, and there were stars everywhere. I think she was frustrated and she just wanted to strike out at somebody. I mean, John really did her a dirty trick, leaving her there in the raft. She took her hands and started moving them in the air like a Spanish dancer, like she was in completely some other world. And then, out of the blue, she just started talking. And it all of a sudden became very clear to me that Meg was speaking in tongues. She's dying, isn't she? She was she was dying. She was really close to death. When we woke up, Meg was dead in the bottom of the dinghy. All that fetid mixture that was left over from the seaweed and the urine and the pus and... Debbie. We were starving and you've heard of cannibalism at sea and are we gonna you know, nourish ourselves by by somehow figuring it out how to butcher her and eat her? Oh, she's too infected, Brad. We have to get rid of her. I'm so hungry. My stomach's twisting in pain. You're right. And so we decided that we would take off her shirt and all of her jewelry so that we could give those to her family. I got really mad at Brad because he was like, I can't get the ring off. I'm like, get it off. It's not like you're gonna hurt her. Just take it off and get it off. <laughs> It was such a sad moment because we laid her body, naked body, on the side of the raft, and uh, and then we um, decided that we couldn't just push her over; that we had to give some kind of a funeral. And so we said the Lord's prayer, 
and Psalm 23. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then we just gently pushed her body overboard. And we decided then that we would just go back to sleep so that if the sharks attacked her, we wouldn't have to see it. And so that's what we did. Ever since I woke up, <laughs> the water in the bottom. Meg's died in it. It's making you ill. The sun's only making it worse. We gotta wash the dinghy out. I care. I don't have the energy. Yes, you do. <laughs> We're turning this thing over right now. What about the sharks? I haven't seen sharks for hours. Come on, Brad. Don't give up on me. And it really scared me because I did not want to have to live in that life raft alone. I gave it a few good pops and I almost got the boat over and then I lost my grip on the line. Ah! <laughs> And this time, I don't have the strength to get myself back into the boat. Only Brad and Debbie remain alive from Trashman's five-man crew. I felt like I had just doomed Brad to death. If the shark showed up, we were screwed. I could give a crap about what Debbie's thinking. She's just sitting there being completely useless, and I'm still alive, and she won't help me climb in the raft. She's finding it impossible to help me to climb into the raft, and I don't know what's on her mind, but she's not thinking straight. There's nothing wrong with Brad's thinking. He's bobbing in an ocean full of sharks. He believes he's too weak to pull himself out. But his rising panic triggers adrenaline to flood into his bloodstream, which dilates his blood vessels and raises his pulse, supplying extra oxygen to his body. The same panic signals trigger a massive response in Brad's arm muscles. This gives him one moment of superhuman strength. <laughs> pulled myself in the boat while she sat three feet away from me just crying. We were each at one end of the raft. He wouldn't talk to me. He was so pissed off at me. I'm so sorry, Brad. I just want to relax because of all this death that's been happening. And as soon as I take a break, I look at the horizon, and there's a ship coming straight at us. I'm going to make it up to you. Let's catch fish. We're going to survive. Debbie, there's a ship. I had heard it was a ship so many times. I just didn't, it, big deal, it's a ship. They're not gonna see us. Turn around. Look how close it is. And I turned around and it was amazing. And the ship came by and it went by and a guy walked out on the wing bridge and looked down at us and I looked at him and he looked at me and I waved at him and he waved at me and next thing I knew there wasn't just one person that came out but there were like five, six people. They were all coming out. They threw all their life-saving equipment out at us. And Debbie jumps off the boat, and I'm like, damn it. You know, don't leave your friend Brad here all alone. What? No goodbyes? Nothing? (laughs) 
I was holding the rope that held the life ring, and they started winching us in. And then a big sailor picked us both up. And when they finally hand me off to the last guy, he just gently lays me on the deck. And I realized that, that they were Russian. And I didn't care. It was, I, I didn't care where I was going. I didn't care who these people were. I was lying there and Brad was there. And we were alive. These guys did a fantastic job getting us on board the vessel, and oh, it was just so great. I mean, the whole thing was just so great. That was just wonderful. And then, you know, but it was just the start of our, of our journey back to life. In their five days at sea, the crew of the Trashmen drifted 140 miles away from where the yacht originally sank. The Coast Guard never sent out a rescue team, stating that they received a phone call saying that the Trashmen had made it safely to port during the storm. No one knows who could have made the call. Had the Russian ship not spotted them, Brad and Debbie would have continued to drift further out to sea. They have no idea how much longer they could have hung on. Brad still sails as a professional yachtsman. Surviving this ordeal changed how he lives his life every day. It's not something you just turn off when it's over. You know, you keep living in that survival mode. You know, I don't know if you're shell-shocked or what you are, but it's impossible to just turn it off and go back to being the way you were before. Debbie is now a writer and motivational speaker. Out of her survival experience came an unshakable positive outlook. I'm here today, and I don't feel guilty about it, and I have no regrets. And every day I wake up, and it's a new day, and I'm happy. And I always, always try to find something good in the bad things that happen to me. There's never a day that you're more thankful for life than the day you almost die.